Good morning. We welcome you to Richlands First Methodist Church, and we are glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. Uh, today is Fellowship Supper Day, so Team C is our lead, I believe. Oh, B, thank you. Team B is in lead, so we want to uh, invite you to stay with us and enjoy some fellowship and good food together this afternoon. Also, if you will take your bulletin, we'll look on the back. We have a few announcements. Uh, Wednesday, April 17th. Uh, at 10 o'clock, it's Bible study, 6 o'clock choir, 7 handbells. And if you also notice there on Saturday, April 20th at 1 to 3, there will be a baby shower for Sydney and Corey for the new little one arriving. Uh, there's plenty of information in the newsletter about how you can check the uh, website for all her uh, gift list and things for the new little one coming. So make a note of that. Uh, also, Helen always is looking for help in the nursery, so contact her if you're willing to help. And pantry items. Items for April, we're working on the peanut butter again, 16-ounce size, and saltine crackers. So just a reminder of that. Any other announcements this morning? Oh, and the rosebud on the altar today is in celebration of a new baby. Myra Lynn Peters was born April 7th, 2024, weighing 6 pounds, 14 ounces, and 19 inches long. She's the daughter of Eric Peters and Jessica Hamer and proud grandmother Sue Peters. So there is a rosebud here to commemorate that wonderful, wonderful milestone in the life of the Peters family. All right. Are there others this morning? Well, Jennifer, I just want to acknowledge the wonderful support through the Cairo ministry. I mean, I think everyone in this church is to be personally thanked by me. <laughs> all right. So Ginger has a big thanks for all those who helped with the Cairo's ministry that was here last week. They had about 24 to 25 men in that group and they hardy ate eaters. hearty eaters she says yes yes i think they cleaned the mashed potatoes out on wednesday night so um nice home cooked meal and it's very thankful for them to kind of come back and relax from the day and kind of prep for the next day while they are there at keen mountain prison with their prison ministry there so we appreciate everyone's help in the kitchen and those who brought food it made it a, a wonderful wonderful outreach are there others uh, they'll be back in October. They come twice a year. So <laughs> early heads up. So some more meals for them in October. So we see the Kairos guys in April or spring and fall, I should say, spring and fall. All right. Any others? Okay. Well, if you will, we'll begin to worship together as we sing hymn 526 in the Methodist hymnal, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. If you'll stand together and sing hymn 526. Do thy Francis for sake. 
Thank you. you may be seated. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh Lord, you are our rock and our refuge. You are the place that we can run to in times of trouble. But you are also, O oh God, our source of joy and of strength and of love. You are the wellspring that springs forth great life and abundance for us. And we give you thanks this morning for all of that, for all that you do for us and in us and through us. We're thankful, O Lord, for this great assembly here in this place on Sunday mornings where we can gather with friends and family and fellow Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can come and we can worship together, truly worship in spirit and in truth to lift up the great and grand name of Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, O oh God, enable us to truly worship you this morning, to bow our hearts low with our heads held high in the knowledge that you, O oh God, are our salvation and our strength. And that as we give ourselves completely over to you, O oh Lord, You are faithful to forgive us of our sins and free us truly for joyful and wonderful obedience to Your Word and to Your will. Lord, we thank You this morning for the great commandment and the great commission that enable us and remind us of our true mission in life, our true purpose that You have created us for that we might go out into the world and not just share love for love's sake, but share love for your sake. And in the name of Christ, do the great deeds that must be done in order to have your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, O oh God, for using us. Thank you, dear Lord, for using our hands and our feet and our mouths to do your will, to let us be a part of the great and wonderful enabling of your kingdom here in our community. We thank you, O oh God, that you have not left us or forsaken us, including those who are sick and in need of your help and your touch this morning. So Lord, we ask those that we have lifted up this morning, whether they be spoken or unspoken, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit to their rescue even in these moments and that they would feel a touch from on high, a healing touch, a loving touch, a spiritual touch. Let all things within them praise the Lord, for they have enabled and been enabled to experience You in a very special way. Thank You for the joys that we have shared this morning together. And thank You for the joys that will be coming here in this coming week for us. Give us a good week, O oh God. Let us look forward to all things that are coming our way with the knowledge that You have already gone before us and that You are in each and everything we will experience as we go through our week together. All these things we pray this morning in the name of the One who came and gave His life for us, who enabled us and who continues to send his, the Holy Spirit to us and who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you will, turn in the faith we sing to hymn 2160, Into My Heart. We'll stand and sing together both verses of hymn 2160 in the faith we sing, Into My Heart.
Thank you. You may be seated.
Okay. Have a small correction to the bulletin this morning. Uh, the scripture this morning is going to be from James 1, uh, verses 2 through 18, not 1 through 12. 2 through 18, if you're following along. And if you would, please stand this morning for the reading of God's Word. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own he will bring forth, bring us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I think sometimes it's often shocking to new Christians when they find that after coming down off the high of the experience of salvation and forgiveness of sin, that they're still plagued with the same kind of temptations that they were before they became a Christian. I remember the time in my life when I came to the altar and gave my life to Christ and I felt the flood of forgiveness for years and years of all of the things that I knew were sinful in my life and the things that I had held shame and regret and all of that grit and grime, if you will, that you, that you carry with you, the heavy burdens that lay on your shoulders all the time. And I thought, ah, finally, now I can rest and things will be at peace in my life. Well, it didn't take too long before that kind of went away. And life just kind of settled back in again, didn't it? You know, we tend to, to sort of settle back into things, not the way that they used to be necessarily, but we find that the same kind of trials and temptations are still there when we come down off of that mountain. So I think it's equally shocking to long-time Christians when we discover that temptation still exists after years and years of building a mature faith. And in fact, temptations to which we figured we would probably become immune to will often still crop up in our lives and will still plague us. I remember a time when I was in a men's group, and there were probably 50 or 60 men in this group, and we were, uh, we were in Valdosta, which is a college town, and, and as college towns are in most cases, especially in the warmer climates, you find there are, let's just say there are some scantily clad ladies walking the streets. 
uh, very, uh, very temptation-oriented, especially when the church was about a block away from the college. And the men were talking about the temptation of our eyes, okay? And I remember the gentleman who was speaking, he said, what we need to do as men is we need to make a covenant with our eyes. Now, my own personal purview of things is you get the first look for free, the second look is sin, okay? <laughs> men, take note. <laughs> But we were, we were saying, okay, so we have to make this covenant with our eyes to make sure that we are keeping ourselves in check as, as men are. And I remember this wonderful little old gentleman, must have been about 85 or 90, been married one time, you know, and he stood up and he said, gentlemen, I don't know what in the world you are talking about. Every morning I have woken up and I have looked over at my wife and told her she is the most beautiful woman in the world. She's the only woman for me. And I have never once looked at another woman. To which there were about 50 of us that said, Oh my gosh, what a liar. (laughs) (laughs) Temptations just don't seem to go away. It's something that's part of our life. It's, it's part of the way that we function in life as a Christian. See, once we know that something is sin, it almost seems like temptation creeps into that part of our life. And in the book of Timothy, Paul encourages this young pastor, Timothy, on the parameters of being a good Christian leader, if you will. And one of the attributes he mentions is to be an overseer that is above reproach. And I wondered, as I read things like that, what does that mean for people like me? What does it mean for Sunday school teachers? What does it mean for my lay leader or my admin board chairperson or the SPR chair or, you know, all of those people that have functions in the church that are in leadership, if you will, and I think people look up to. And does that mean that they will never stumble or fall? Does it mean that if they succumb to temptation at one point in time or another and they sin, does that drive them out of the ability to be good workers of God? And the answer to that is absolutely not. In fact, if nothing else, I think sometimes temptation and the fact that sometimes we can beat it and sometimes we can't is part of our witness to God. It's part of the fact that we have God on our side and that there are times when, yes, we are going to stumble and fall, but even a mature faith needs to guard from the temptations in life, but also have the great witness of knowing that there will be times when God will be victorious over those temptations. They are not the death nail in our Christian witness. Nobody is beyond the influence of the master of deception, the author of chaos, the great tempter, if you will. And once we understand temptation, maybe we might be a little better equipped to conquer it effectively. Now, you may believe that you don't really have temptations. And... Maybe the fact is, or the reality is, if they're tuned into your thoughts and actions, you'll find that there are more temptations in life than you actually even acknowledge. Have you ever been unkind to someone out of a selfish desire to get what you want? Have you ever been unkind to someone just because you just kind of felt like it, but there really wasn't any reason to hurt their feelings? Have you ever taken authority when you weren't really given that authority to have? Have you ever judged someone based on your own beliefs and your own upbringing without due diligence on what's going on in their life? Have you ever had feelings for someone you would be ashamed to admit to your spouse that you had? 
Have you ever been tempted to take something because you deserved it, but it really wasn't yours to take? The list could go on and on and on. See, that's where I believe Jesus reinterpreted the Ten Commandments for us. That there is more to just temptation and there is more to just sin than what's on the surface of things. James, in his book, is speaking to what is known as the diaspora, which are the Jews that were disconnected from the family in Jerusalem and they were scattered throughout the land. And many of these people likely did not have the equivalent of a local church, if you will, to which they would be accountable and could count on for encouragement and accountability. And see, that's where I truly believe the rubber meets the road. And I have said this before, I think every Christian needs to be number one part of a local congregation that they can be part of, not just to worship together, but to have a common place to, to be and to where people know you and people can help you along life's narrow way, if you will. But also that every Christian ought to be a part of a Sunday school class or some kind of a Bible study or something where you can do more than just sit in the pew and listen to me talk and rant and rave every Sunday morning. But you can actually ask questions and you can delve into the kind of things that you wonder about in your own life. See, we don't have a Q&A at the end of the sermon, do we? I know some of you have actually asked for that, but no, that's not going to happen in church. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> I'm afraid of what questions I might actually get, to be honest with you. <laughs> but no, there's, you know, there's supposed to be some accountability and truthfully, we know about accountability in Southwest Virginia, folks, don't we? This is a small town where everybody knows your business. Everybody knows what's going on with everybody else, don't they? Everybody nod your head yes, because you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's a small town. It's a small town mentality. You don't have to necessarily be a part of a church to have people know what's going on in your life, which can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. You know if you do something, someone is going to hear about it quickly, and it's probably going to spread throughout the community, and that is what you call accountability. It was a great time in our American heritage when you used to be able to let your kids roam around in the community because you knew that all of your friends and neighbors were watching your kids for you, and they would let you know if your kid did something they weren't supposed to do, wasn't it? Can't do that anymore, folks, unfortunately, but it was a great time in American history when that could happen. So what does James say about temptation that we need to look at today? Well, first, I think we need to have some proper orientation because most people would say that you need to insulate yourself from the things that they're, phone, they're prone to fall prey to. And James says something very interesting, really, in, in the depth of his text. He says, don't hide from them, but rather welcome those kinds of things in like friends. Why? Because I think it gives opportunity for the power of God to be displayed in your life. If we completely insulate ourselves from things that will tempt us, from things that will harm us, then guess where that leaves us? That leaves us sitting at home with no radio, with no television, and with no contact with anybody else. That is not good for us. We need to live our lives because I believe that that's how we will learn and how we will grow and how we will become better Christians having the process of both conquering temptation but also in our failing to conquer temptation. It's an, it's an opportunity for us to demonstrate to the world what it's like to be a true Christian. See, people out there, I think, sometimes get the, the wrong idea about Christian folks. They think that 
because we come to church on Sunday morning or be, you know, perhaps because we've been Christian all of our lives or maybe have had this radical experience of giving our life to Christ that somehow or other we're better than everybody else out there. That we're different, that, that we don't experience the same kind of life that everybody else does. Does anybody agree with that that's in here? I mean, there are certain things that are better about our lives. There is no doubt about it. But there are also parts of our lives that are very similar to every single human experience. And those are the things that I believe give us an opportunity to display the power of God. So I think there are five things, there are five purposes in in why God allows temptation to happen to each and every person, including Christians. The first is that it is a test that strengthens our faith. You know, our faith is worth nothing at all if it's weak and spindly and without some kind of support. Faith needs to grow. Faith needs to blossom. Faith needs to to become what it is going to become as we mature in our faith. And James is a driving force for the godly notion that faith without the work to support it, to undergird it, and to display it is worthless. You remember what James says about works? Faith without works is what? It's dead, folks. We need to be able to utilize what we learn in life which means that we're going to have to go through life and not just insulate ourselves from it. We can't just watch faith and ministry happen. It's worth nothing if we're not doing the work of God. If we're not doing the will of God. And temptation allows us to practice living in the strength of our faith or it will just simply uncover weakness of it And it will keep us from stepping out in dependence on God. See, temptation is an opportunity for us to put our full dependence on God's strength and our faith. And to allow that faith to be strengthened. Yes, sometimes we have to go through negative things in order for good things to happen. So temptation number two will increase our endurance, and our patience. When we face temptations, we're either going to succumb to them or, going to, or we're going to conquer them, one of the two. When we fail, hopefully we're going to learn from it and we'll seek strength for the future encounters that are coming. When we conquer it, God is helping to equip us for, the, for life's bigger challenges. You know, it seems to me that the older we get, the bigger the challenge. Don't you think? In a lot of ways, we face larger challenges as older folks than we do as younger folks. And that's not just because life happens in that kind of sequence of events, but I think life challenges us in ways that we don't even think about when we're younger You know, when I was 20 years old, I wasn't ever thinking about mortality. I wasn't losing friends and neighbors. I wasn't thinking about, you know, retirement or what I'm going to do or how I was going to even, how I was even going to eat. You know, shoot, when Susie met me, I was living off of Coca-Cola and potato chips and everything was just fine. You know, I didn't realize until she came into my life and started cooking that I actually needed real food. Life was different. Life is different today. And it builds endurance and patience for us to go through trials and temptations and to go through that ebb and flow of conquer and failure. And so it also not only produces endurance and patience, but number three, It allows God to mature our faith. Mature faith will come through examples and experience. You know, the Bible is chock full of stories of faith, temptation, sin, and then more faith. It always brings us back to God. 
And that's where our lives need to be reminded whenever we go through trials and temptations that it always ends up in God's hands, folks. You might be experiencing some pretty major stuff in your life right now. Maybe it's a loved one that's going through some things that you're feeling the pain of. Maybe it's just life itself that is providing a challenge for you today. But the reality of it is is that everything always ends up in the hands of God if we allow it to happen that way. And God will always bring something good out of what is happening in your life. I love that song that says, if it's not good, God's not done with it yet. And isn't that the truth? God is not finished with us until something good happens through each and every experience of our life. That is what we call mature faith. And just like, you know, we will never know more about God if we never pick up the Bible, we'll also never know more about His strength in our life if we're not exposed to the experiences that allow God to work in our life. We need to go through those things. Yes, there are always going to be some things that we need to try to avoid. Make a covenant with your eyes. Make a covenant with your heart. Make a covenant with whatever it is that you struggle with to try to get better and better and better. But realize that it always ends up in God's hands. That we are truly weak people without the strength of God in our life. We talked a couple of weeks ago in our Bible study about being totally depraved. Depraved meaning that we have no goodness in us without God in our life. That we are born without goodness. But God puts goodness into us. And God will always bring goodness out of the situations in your life if we allow it to happen. And that matures our faith. It produces strength and endurance and character. And we will always grow from from experiences both good and bad. But number four, God develops independence through temptations. Now, I'm not talking about independence from God, but independence from other people who will drive our morality in the wrong direction. Did you catch that? That will drive our morality in the wrong direction. Now, tell me that is not happening today. The world is trying to teach us that something is okay Because it's legal in our legal system, but it's not okay truly in the kingdom of God. That is never more true today than when it comes to sexual relationships. Because the truth of the matter is, is God has never ordained living together out of wedlock and having non-biblical sexual relationships. Today, we're trying to be taught to join the crowd. Join the group. Everybody else is on board with it. We might as well join. Guess what, folks? That's why we're a global Methodist church today. Because we have chosen to stand apart from the United Methodist Church, which bless their hearts, are going through some major troubles of joining the crowd of the world. They have succumbed to what the world is trying to teach them. Don't allow yourself to join a crowd that is going to take you in the wrong direction. Allow yourself to be independent people. Independent in the fact that you are Christian that you are standing with the will of God and that you will do what His Word says, not what the world tries to tell you is right. Whenever you have a question, look to the good book. Look to the right book. Don't just look at the law and see whether or not it's legal because just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. 
And that is the truth. The fifth thing is that God will allow conquering through temptation because God will provide rewards through it. James says we are blessed and given the crown of life in verse 12. And I think the truth is our, re- our true happiness will depend on how clean our consciences are and it, by the measure of our relationship with our God. Did you catch that? How clean our consciences are and how deep our relationship is with God. See, I truly believe that the, the closer we are with God, the more we will see the temptations that are coming in our life, the more we'll be able to conquer the temptations in our life, which provides for us more of a clean conscience in our life. And all in the circle of it all brings us closer to God again. Because when God does something great in our life, we love Him more and more and more, and it produces even a greater and stronger of a circle that will always bring us closer to Him. The hard part about all of this is that the responsible one to take the bull by the horns is you and me. We have to start the ball rolling. It is too easy for us to just simply say, oh, the devil made me do it, and pass the buck. Now, I know we've never heard anybody pass the buck. Adam and Eve started it. They were the first ones to come up with excuses for why temptation got the best of them. What did Adam say? Oh, That woman you gave me gave me the fruit and I ate it. Boy, that was an excuse God bought, didn't He? And we have done nothing but perfect that through the ages. It's it's been always the easiest to pass the blame for things for everybody else except ourselves. You know, we, we did this because Mama didn't love us enough. We did that because Daddy... Used to, used to beat us when we were bad. We, all of these things, you know, sin is always the fault of everyone else except the sinner. And we have trouble taking the blame for things that we do, even though that may produce in us endurance and patience and steadfastness and mature faith. We can even resolve today, like we do today that sin is just made up and none of this really matters anyway. But you can't do that if you know what's on God's heart. It doesn't take away the truth of God's Word. Jesus understood that the old sacrificial system of offering animals in countless droves never truly cleared the heart of His people And he knew that he needed to provide a sacrifice once and for all that would provide for us a way to have clean consciences and stronger faith. And so he went to the cross for us. He went to the cross for the forgiveness of our sin before we even thought of the sin. And we need to know the experience of living in the good graces of God through welcoming temptation as an opportunity to shine for God. Not looking for trouble, mind you. Don't go looking for trouble. But when trouble finds you, offer it as an opportunity for God to shine in your life and for our witness to become greater to offer ourselves in faith to God's strength to overcome that temptation and to take responsibility for our own junk without trying to reason things out. You know, we we can justify all we want, but we will never change God's mind about what is right and what is wrong. And maybe, you know, just because you don't read the particular part of this book that addresses your sin it doesn't mean that you can say you're living in the blessings of God. I would say dig deeper. Always know what God's Word says about what's going on in your life. 
You know, someone once said you, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can sure prevent them from making a nest in your hair. And that is true. We can't avoid temptation in our life. We can't avoid it completely unless we insulate ourselves completely. But God wants to work through you this morning. Whatever you're dealing with, God wants to work with you and through you to offer you an opportunity for a way out and a way to a clean conscience so that God can forgive you of what you have already done in your heart and offer you strength, perhaps, to not do it again. There is hope. Whatever you're going through today, life will offer some hope. Because remember, remember, if it's not good, God's not done with you yet. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our closing hymn is from the United Methodist Hymnal, hymn 397. 397. I need thee every hour. We're seeing verse 1, 2, 4, and 5. 1, 2, 4, and 5 of him, 397. so much for the blessing of just giving and the ability to give. Lord, bless these tithes, these offerings that we are about to present to you as we leave this place. Let them truly be a, a significant sign of our faith and our love for you and a blessing to your kingdom that all things might glorify the name of Christ our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
go from this place with the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Let all things in life praise the Lord, and may the temptations and the trials that you go through be an opportunity to glorify God. Lord, we ask now that you would bless the meal that we are about to share as a family of God, as a congregation of Richlands First Methodist Church. Let each and every morsel of food we take bring us closer to you and glorify your name. Bless the gift and the giver alike and the preparer of this food and those who will share in it. And all these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you.